بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا ونفعنا ما تعلمنا وزدنا بفضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير Okay, so we saw a lot last week um, and so we're continuing with the side discussions we mentioned the key thing that we learned last week was you see a hadith or even a number of hadiths and you assume something, don't assume until you have uh, left every single stone unturned. And then you see how things work. Right? And that's why we need to study fiqh. Because when you see a madhab, it means an attempt. It is not a perfect attempt. But it is an attempt that is, is exhaustive and is systematized and has been checked and verified for a long time to guarantee that it is a valid answer to this problem right so there's a number of words that i use there they're important valid as opposed to correct to the problem okay people look at the situation this is obvious why are we even discussing this it's obviously haram it's obviously halal that's because you haven't seen everything when you see all the evidence you see there's a problem it is not clear therefore it needs to be researched for a long time and it has been researched for a long time, and this is a valid answer as opposed to the correct answer. What is the correct answer? That's in Allah's hands, we don't know. But what we're interested in is finding a valid answer. And so a practical thing then is when I want to find out halal haram, I follow a madhab because I know that a madhab is a system that has left every single stone, uh, has not left a single stone unturned, as opposed to my own attempt or the attempt of one sheikh or another sheikh may or may not be exhaustive. So, so he says, doing ghusl on the days of Eid. Okay, so we just had the discussion of uh, Jum'ah and about Eid. So it says, Malik informed us, Nafi narrated to us that, uh, so it says, Akhbarna Malikun haddathana Nafi'un an ibn Umar kana yaghtasilu qabla an yaghduwa ila al-Eid. Nafi narrated to us that Ibn Umar used to do ghusl before he went out to the Eid prayer. Okay. Let's go to the page. أخبرنا مالك أخبرنا نافع عن ابن عمر أنه كان يغتسل يوم الفطر قبل أن يغدو. مالك فهم درس نافع نريته توصل ابن عمر uh, from ابن عمر that he used to do غسل on the day of the Eid al-Fitr before going out. قال محمد الغسل يوم العيد حسن وليس بواجب وهو قول أبو حنيفة رحمه الله. Right, same discussion there. Uh, doing غسل on Eid is good though it is not obligatory and that's the verdict of Abu حنيفة رحمه الله. Okay, and then he says, "Bab at tayammu bas bis saidi." Right, she translates it here, or he translates it as "said" as dust. It's not necessarily the only translation of "said." The word "said" is it is a is something that is debated what it actually means. So uh, uh, Allah uh, so uh, he says, "Akhbarna Malikun, akhbarna Nafi'un, annahu akbala huwa wa Abdullah ibn Umar min al jurth, hatta kana bil mirbad." نزل عبد الله بن عمر فتيمم صعيدا طيبا ومسح وجهه ويديه إلى المرفقين ثم صلى. So it says uh, Malik informed us that Nafi informed us that he had come up from Al Jurth, so he's a traveler with Abdullah ibn Umar. When he reached Al Mirbad, Abdullah ibn Umar got down and did tayammum with pure earth. So again, this is the translation. This is not the actual word. The, so the question here, this word is used in the Quran, a Sa'id. It's used here in the Arabic. And then with pure earth, this is one of the issues that we're trying to find out what it even means. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, فَتَيَمَّمُوا صَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا So then seek out pure Sa'id. What is pure Sa'id? What does that even mean? Here this word is being used again. This word is not clear. We don't know what it means. It is not clear. The position of the Hanafis and the Malikis, it is anything masa'ada min wajhil ard. Anything that is that comes up from the face of the earth, like a rock on the face of the earth, or a stone on the face of the earth, or dust on the face of the earth, or earth on the face of the earth. This is called sa'id. So you can wipe your hand on a stone, or you can wipe your hand on a pebble, or you can wipe your hand on a boulder, or you can wipe your hand on the dust on the floor, the dirt that comes up from the ground, 
or you can wipe your hand on, on earth and you wipe your face. Okay, the position of the Hanafi, the, uh, the uh, Shafi'is and Hanbalis is that it is specifically dust that rises. Hence the translation here, dust, right? Is that you are actually using dust as an animal would do, right? So I remember once, uh, 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 what was this? This is uh, two weeks ago. My chickens came out of their cage on a hot day. Okay, what did they do? Their number one goal is to find a new place of dust to, to roll around on. But the animals will do this, right? So chickens will do this specifically because they need to get dust into their feathers. Uh, it kills mites and whatever else it does for them. Maybe it cools them down. I don't know what else. But it's a hot day. Their number one goal is find a place where there is dust and, and get as much dust under their feathers as possible, right? So they're actually conveying some material to their parts of the body. Right, like we do in wudu, and also you actually conveying, you're using water there. Okay. Um. So uh, now uh, that's that's it's in Arabic called a tamak, right? One of the Sahaba did this. He didn't know about tayammum, but he just did this because he didn't have any other. Um, uh, he didn't have any other form of making ablution, and then Prophet some demonstrated. So, is that what you're doing? Like you are you are washing your face and arms with dust, as an animal might do, or are you doing something that is purely symbolic, purely symbolic, in that you are wiping your hand over a stone, and there's nothing going onto your hand whatsoever, and you're wiping your face as a spiritual cleansing. And then you're wiping your hand on the dust again and wiping your arms as a spiritual cleansing. Is that what's happening? That's the debate. Okay. So here, we, we should just leave it as a tayammum with a sa'id. Just leave it in the Arabic, meaning I don't know what that is. Because it is a genuine issue of debate. <clears throat> and then prayed. Okay, but the significance then is, what does he say is, well, he says here, he says, wiped his face and up to his elbows. So, again, an issue of debate. When we perform tayammum, do we perform tayammum up to our hands or up to our elbows? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly stated that with your in wudu, you wash your arms up to your elbows. That's clearly mentioned in the context of wudu. In the context of tayammum, it just says, and, and wipe your face as an arms. So when you say arm, that means from your fingertips all the way up to your shoulders. Do you wipe the whole thing? Or do you do what you do in wudu because it's replacing wudu? Or do you only wipe your hands? Okay, and that's another, um, uh, another uh, position of minority, I believe of the, um, I believe uh, the, uh, um, Hanbalis or 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 Hanbalis or Malikis. Let me just double check quickly right now. Hanbalis.
Yeah. He was a tumor and which he were This is the Hanbali school and the Malihi school. And this is also adopted by Imam and Nawi. Okay, so that's another discussion, right? So here it demonstrates he's going up to his elbows, which is important. Okay, and so notice how Imam Malik is not quoting a hadith, right? So it's almost as if Imam Malik is saying, Yes, we know the hadith for and against. I'm giving you the final punch, which is what? There's a hadith for and against, but look, here is Ibn Omar. And I have a golden chain, a super reliable chain, back to what Ibn Omar did, and that's my source, right? So again, we've mentioned this before. Is it the Maliki school, or is it the Ibn Omar school? So you think Maliki, oh, that's this thing, that's a name. That, that's just a word from the Medinan school. So Medinan school means the school of Ibn Omar, and as we're going to see, Aish and others. Uh, right, so who this is, so this is who, who to understand who is Imam Malik, right? So let's just let's let's use this as an opportunity right now, a learning opportunity. We're going to see with this chain who is Imam Malik. So, Imam Malik, let's just let's remove his name, okay, and just say. Mufti. In Medina, given, told to give fatwa by over 100 muftis. Okay? So imagine, for example, you said there's a doctor, okay? He's a brain surgeon, and 100 other brain surgeons said that he was good, right? That's not an ad hominem argument. That is ad hominem argument. He's Imam Malik, therefore he's good. No. Who is Imam Malik? So just we'll take his name out and describe who he is. Okay. Let's look at one of his one of his teachers. One of his many teachers are Nafi. Who is Nafi? A freed slave. Ibn Omar. Who's Ibn Omar? Oh, he's the son of son of second Khalifa. Right? Plus brother of wife of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh, that's pretty important, right? So he's 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 gonna be pretty important quite in person. Lots of hadiths from him, and he's young. Notice he's gonna rate lots of hadiths. So this is this is who this is who he is. They like, oh, that's who you're talking about. So Imam Malik is the grand student of this person. That's quite important. Okay, who else is Imam Malik? Oh, look, he says. In this hadith, in this hadith number uh, 72, it says, Akhbarna Malikin, Akhbarna Abdurrahman ibn Qasim. Hmm. Who's, who's Abdurrahman ibn Qasim? Right? So he's, so another of this mufti, this person, one of his teachers is Abdurrahman. Hmm. Who's Abdurrahman? This is the son of Son of Al Qasim. Who's Al Qasim? Oh, this is Al Qasim, who was raised in house of Aisha. Oh wow, that's pretty important. Aisha radiallahu anha wasn't she one of the greatest fuqaha ever? Oh yeah, wow. So this person, he 
uh, he was uh, the student, the student, the grand student of this person was raised in the house of Aisha. So he must be exposed to tons of hadiths and know tons of things about the deen. Right? Who is Qasim then? Why was he raised in the house of Aisha? Because he is a son of Muhammad. Okay? Who's Muhammad? Son of Abu Bakr. Oh, wow, that's pretty important. But more important than that is this Muhammad is not only the son of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he's also raised by Sayyidina Ali. Wow, that's crazy. So who is this? Uh, 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 Aisha radiallahu anha her father is Sayyidina Abu Bakr, correct? Sayyidina Abu Bakr married Sayyidina Ja'far's ex-wife or right, so Sayyidina Ja'far died in, in Jordan in Jihad, so Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abu Bakr married her right? Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abu Bakr right? Asma bint Umais Asma bint Umais gives birth to Muhammad Sayyidina Abu Bakr passes away. Then, say, then Asma bint Umais married Sayyidina Ali. So she was married to Sayyidina Ja'far, the brother of Sayyidina Ali, older brother of Sayyidina Ali. Then she marries Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And then she marries her ex-husband's brother, Sayyidina Ali. And he raises Muhammad. So this is Muhammad, who's kind of the son of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, kind of the son of Sayyidina Ali. Okay. He has Al Qasim and I think Hafsa, I think I can't remember her name. Okay. They he goes to Egypt. And Muhammad is murdered in Egypt, and Qasim is sent back to be raised in the house of Aisha. So wow, that's really important. Okay? That's really important. Okay? And so we see this connection to Ahl Bayt to the to, to Sayyidina Omar. Why is this so small? Right? To say no Omar, to say no Abu Bakr, to say no Ali, to Aisha radiallahu anha, Ibn Omar. Right? This is who this person is. Right? A mufti in Medina in the early second century uh, uh, told to give fatwa by over 100 muftis of Medina. Okay, wow. So he must be really, really good. Right? So often the name and what we associate with a name confuses us about what the person is. Right? Isn't that a quote from Shakespeare? What's in a name? That's some kind of Shakespeare quote, isn't it? What's in a name? Right? That's a line that's in Romeo and Juliet. What's in a name? To that which we call the rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So why do you have to call it Rose? Like, does it change because you call it Rose? Like, does the does the name define what something is? Right? So what I'm trying to say is frequently we have like the word Madhab. Like, what's that? That's confusing. Like, what is that? Like, it sounds like something. It sounds like, I don't know, that maybe, you know, it's like a, a sect. Like, look it up. Madhab means sect. Or it means like strict. Or I don't know what it is. Like, what is the reality of something? It's very important to look at what is the reality of something, right? We call it, we call it this, you call it that. Take away the name and look at the reality of a thing. What is the Maliki school? The Maliki school is the process of condensing the fiqh of Medina and editing it for a thousand years. That is the Maliki school. So it's impossible for the Maliki school to be invalid. That's impossible. In the Maliki school, it doesn't have to be right, but it cannot be invalid, right? So somebody comes along and says, you know, I don't want to follow the Maliki school, fine. Somebody comes along and says, um, I, I think the Maliki school is is uh, is oppressive. I say, but you can't say that. I think the Maliki school is strict. I think the Maliki school is really, is too easy on something. 
or it's to this. I think it goes against the Quran and Sunnah. Invalid. That's an invalid statement because you cannot say that the that the Maliki school is not a valid interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah. It doesn't have to make it make it right, whether it's right or wrong or something else, right? But you, but it is definitely valid, and that's what we're interested in. It's definitely valid. So whether it's right or wrong is fairly academic. It's fairly theoretical. What's interesting is, is it valid? So can I follow the Maliki school? Yes. Should I have confidence like this is a real, like this is a real means? Like if I want to find halal haram, I go and ask a Maliki, somebody who's trained in Maliki fiqh, is it halal for me to, to do this? Is it haram? And they say this. Whether they agree with another madhab, whether they disagree, whether they agree with my interpretation or your interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah, that's fairly irrelevant. Just knowing what the Maliki school is, is enough to say that it's a valid interpretation, is a valid means for you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so it says, "Akbarna Malikun, Akbarna Abdul Rahman ibn Qasim an Abihi, an Aishata." Why? Why would Qasim be narrating from Aisha? Because they narrated in the same place. رضي الله عنها أنها قالت خرجنا مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في بعض أسفاره حتى إذا كنا للبيداء أو بذات بذات الجيش انقطع إقدي فأقام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على التماسه وقام الناس وليس على ماء وليس معهم ماء فأتى الناس إلى أبي بكر فقالوا ألا ترى إلى ما صنعت عائشة أقامت في رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبالناس وليس مع ماء وليس معهم ماء قالت فجاء أبو بكر رضي الله عنه ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم واضع رأسه على فخذ قد نام فقالت حبستي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والناس وليس على ماء وليس معهم ماء قالت فاعتبني وقال ما شاء أن يقول وجعل يطعنني يطعنني طعن يطعن بيده في خاصرتي فلا يمنعني من التحرك إلا رأس رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على فخذي فنام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى أصبح على غير ماء فأنزل الله آية التيمم فتيمم فقال أسيد بن حضير ما هي بأول بركتكم يا آل بيتي يا, يا آل أبي بكر قالت وبعث وبعثنا البعير التي كنت عليه فوجدنا الإقدى تحته So Malik informs us from عبد الرحمن ibn Qasim who informed us from his father that Aisha said, we went out with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a journey. And we went out to al Bayda or that al Jaish. My necklace broke and was lost. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam halted and, uh, to look for it. And the people halted with no water nearby and no water with them. The people came to Abu Bakr and said, do you see what Aisha has done? Look at her, such an annoying woman. Halted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and people. And everyone, you could say, not the people, but and everyone, with no water nearby. With no water nearby uh, with them. She said, and Abu Bakr arrived while the Prophet was sleeping uh, with his head on my thigh. And Abu Bakr said, you have detained the Messenger of Allah Sassam, and the people with no water nearby and no water with them. She said, he reproved me or retromanded. He said all sorts of things to me. He's like, oh, you're so annoying. Why are you doing this? Like, you're talk he's talking to his, to his daughter, right? Uh, and he started jabbing me in the hip with his hand. He's like, oh, man, what's your problem? And the only reason I didn't move was because I had the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on my thigh. So he's all telling me off and giving me a hard time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam slept until morning and he was without water. And so Allah sent down the ayah of tayammum. 
So notice, so this is people of Barakah, right? They perform tayammum, so you have to be very, very careful around special people. And who are special people? You don't know. So be very careful around everybody. So people who you know are special, you have to be very careful around them. This is the wife of the Prophet, so them. Don't don't say anything. This is so and so. Don't say anything, right? If you know somebody is special, or you get the sense that there's somebody special in Allah's eyes, be very careful around them, because you don't know how Allah looks at them. You don't know how Allah overlooks them. You don't know what's going on. This is a very special lady, and because of her necklace, the verse was revealed, right? Because of her necklace, right? And so she's a special lady. And she's a special family, and these are special people in Allah's eyes. So you have to have adab, right? Sometimes you will see things from certain people that you'll be disturbed about. You're like, why do they do, do that? Why do they say that? Zip it. Unless there's something haram that you need to, that you're obliged to correct, don't say anything, right? You, you'll notice certain things from certain people, but don't judge people. And if you know that they're special in Allah's eyes, just leave it. Be like Sayyidina Musa and Sayyidina Khidr. Are you are you saying a khidr? No. Okay, don't don't I don't know what they're doing, then just leave it. Um he said, This is not the first of your blessings of family of the of Abu Bakr, right? So you you are you're very Mubarak people, lots of things about you. She said, We wrote we roused the camel which I which I had been on, and we found the necklace underneath it. Um so the number of things in this hadith, number one, the whole thing about Tayamun. So before there was no such thing as tayammum. If you didn't have w w water, what would you do? And indeed, what would you do? So one version of this hadith, and there's many versions of this hadith, mentions that in this situation, some people prayed without wudu. So let's 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 apply this case, right? So we have we now have two options, right? We have a you have water, and b you don't have water. Okay. So we're not we're never gonna have that fixed scenario of what would I do if I couldn't make tayam if I couldn't make wudu because we can make tayamum, correct? But we do have the fixed scenario today, which is what would you do if you couldn't make wudu or you couldn't make tayamum? Both. So I for example, I'm chained to a wall. I'm in prison and I'm chained to a wall. I can't make wudu because I can't move. I can't make tayamum because I can't move. So what do I do? Right, I am. There is, uh, uh, I am in a place that's just frozen ice everywhere. There's no water. I can't even freeze the. Uh, I can't melt the ice around me. It's totally dry, okay, because it's frozen. I can't melt it to make wudu, and I can't make tamam because there's nothing to make tamam on. Okay, or let's say for example for the Shafis and the Hanbalis, there's no dust. Okay, there is no water per se, but there is also no dust. So what am I going to do? Okay, so one version of this hadith mentions that they prayed anyway. So Ibn Mundur of the Shafi's, he says, here we go. This proves to us that in the case where you cannot make wudu or tayammum, A, you still pray, and B, there is no repetition of the prayer. Okay, that's what he tells us. If there was that, because here they had one option, which is wudu, and they prayed anyway, and so therefore they prayed without wudu at all. They didn't have, there was no wudu and there was no substitute, and they weren't told to repeat the prayer, so therefore they just prayed and that's it. So in which case, I'm chained to a wall, I can't make wudu or tayammu because I can't move or because I can't access anything at all. You just pray as you are and that's it. That's it. Okay, that's, that's option number one. Now, is that agreed upon to be sahih? And is that agreed upon to be the right interpretation? Not necessarily. Okay. So the Shafi school, so Ibn Munda, that's his opinion. He's an early Shafi. The Shafi school says the following. You can't do either. What are you going to do then? Then you have to do, you have to, you have to do whatever you can. So do whatever kind of wudu you can, half of a wudu, half of a tayyamun, whatever you can do, everything you can do, plus pray, Plus repeat. Right? Plus pr pray and plus repeat. So you end up praying twice. 
right? And that's practical. So the Shafi school, when, when would that happen? A practical thing in the Shafi school, you have an injury on your finger. Okay? So you're not able to wash that because you have an injury in your finger. Okay? So make tayam mom instead. Well, I can't make tayam mom because I have an injury on my finger. So what does the Shafi school say? The Shafi school says, make wudu as best as you can. Wipe over the injury as best as you can. Make tayammum as best as you can. Pray and repeat later on. So you make tayammum a 90% tayammum, will do a 90% tayammum, and you do everything that you can do, and you pray as you are right now, and later on you're going to repeat the prayer. Okay? Ibn Mundir of the Shafi'is and other people like Imam like Imam Muzani and Imam Nawi, they said, no, 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 no. What are you talking about? You just just pray now and that's it. Okay? But now let's go back to this scenario. I can't make wudu and I can't make tayammu. Isn't it haram to pray without wudu? Right? Like you can't pray without wudu, right? So couldn't it be argued as well that in a scenario where you couldn't make wudu or tayammu, you would do neither and you would do nothing. So i.e., you would say, Allah has told me to pray, but he has not given me access to water, nor has he been able to make tayammum. So therefore, Allah has forbidden me to pray. That's an argument as well. Right? Like, I can't do this, can I? Because I, 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 he's not given me the means in order to fulfill this obligation. So therefore, I, I, I'm A, I'm not obliged to do it, and B, it's actually sinful for me to, I shouldn't do it. Right? And therefore, I should just make it up later. Like, basically, just wait. So this is what, uh, this is what uh, um, Sayyidina Umar said. Sayyidina Umar, he said, in the scenario, uh, this is specific to Ghusl, though, specific to Ghusl. Ibn uh, Sayyidina Umar, he said, Tayammum is for wudu. Tayammum is not for ghusl. So he said, if you are in a place where you do not have water to make ghusl, you just don't pray for like ever. Like you just don't pray, that's it. Like you just don't pray. Which is obviously, you know, wrong. So again, even if Sayyidina Omar said that, he's saying Omar, but you know, the people, the scholars didn't agree with him over time. But if you look at the, the paradigms here, right? Paradigm A, uh, so paradigm, or answer A would be just pray anyway and don't repeat. Answer two would be, okay, well, you can't make either, so just pray anyway and then repeat it later properly. Answer B is, you don't have wudu and you don't have tayammum, you can't pray like that. What are you talking about? So don't pray and don't make it up. Answer, answer D would be, Okay, Allah hasn't given you the means to pray now, so therefore you shouldn't pray now. But uh, you can eventually pray, and so therefore you will have to pray at some point. So basically, you're chained to a wall now. Don't do anything now. Don't pray. And just wait till you can get off these chains and make tayammum or make wudu, and then make up those prayers, right? So which is the correct answer? So we're going to do the following. We're going to say, these are four logical answers. Answer one, do your best, and that's all you have to do. Answer two, do your best, and then repeat later on. Answer three, don't do anything because Allah has not asked you to pray because he hasn't given you the means to pray. Answer C, he hasn't given you the means to pray now, so just do it later on. Right? These are all legitimate answers. So we're going to say, any of these four answers are legitimate. Whichever of these things has been backed by positions of the fuqaha, let's say they say, for example, the Shafi say this, the Maliki say this, whatever, anything that's been backed by any of the former Zahid, that means it has a basis in the Salaf and it's been checked and verified by the Khalaf or the late scholars. And that's that's a good answer. So they're all valid answers. Any of those four that have not gone through that checks and balances, meaning it is not, it doesn't have any foot, no, no basis in the set with the early Muslims, and none of the late scholars have confirmed that, then and it's not it's not adopted as the Maliki school or the Hanbali school or anything, then it's just a theoretical position, right? Just there, like like Sayyidina Omar's position, right? That you don't pray ever, right? Or something like that. 
right? Okay, does that make sense? There's a theory and the, the can you can everyone see the process that we're doing here? Is it making sense? Uh, sister Kalini, sister, or is it everybody else? Muhammad, Sayyid. Yes. Okay. Okay, next point then. So it says, Bab a Rajul Yusibu Minim Ratihi wa Yubashiruha Wahia Ail. So it says, man's having sexual intercourse with his wife. Um or lying skin to skin with her during her menstrual period. Okay. Okay. So he says, أخبرنا مالك أخبرنا نافع أن عبد عمر أرسل إلى عائشة يسألها. Notice the context. Aisha is a key fiqh to intimate things because she's the wife of the Prophet. Yes, Elo, Hell, you, yes, Elo, Hell, you bashiru a rojulu imraatahu, wa he a hild, but call it Lita should the Izaroha ala asfaliha, thumma you bashiruha in sha. So, hadith number 73. Malik informed us from Nafir, informed us that Abdullah ibn Umar sent Aisha asking her, May a man be skin to skin, you bashiruha skin, with his wife during her menstrual period? She asked, uh, she tie, uh, she, she should tie her izar, the large cloth, wrap around. Izar is something that goes from the, uh, goes to from her sh sh uh, large cloth wrapped around the lower half of the body, around her lower body, and then can lie skin to skin with her if he wants. Qala Muhammad, wa bihada na'khud, la ba'si bithalika, wa huwa qawlu abi hanifata wal ammati min fuqaha'ina. Um, so we get, uh, um, so he says, we adhere to this. There's no harm in doing that. It is the of Hanifa and our fuqaha. Notice, what does this remind us again? It, what is the Hanafi school? Is the Hanafi school Imam Abu Hanifa? No. Fuqaha una. So there is a system that is coming from Kufa that precedes Imam Abu Hanifa. And there is a system that comes after Imam Abu Hanifa that goes after him. Okay? And so... Uh, 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 that goes after him. That's called the Hanafi school. The Hanafi school is not Imam Abu Hanifa. So somebody comes along and says, well, Imam Abu Hanifa, to all due respect, is he a god? Is, does he know everything? No. So then why are you Hanafi then? Oh, good point. Well, they'll say, you know, Imam Bukhari became, came after Imam, uh, uh, Imam uh, Abu Hanifa. So there's some hadith, for example, that in Bukhari that Imam Hanifa didn't know. Like, that's not how that's irrelevant. That's not going to do anything. But did the Hanafi school, meaning those people who worked on that system, did they know all the hadiths in Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, everywhere else? Of course. So their system is exhaustive, even if that individual is not. So again, the Hanafi school is definitely a valid explanation of the Quran and Sunnah. You cannot come along and say it is not a valid and turned understanding. Like I like all the schools, but not Hanafis. You know, Hanafis they're kind of funny. You know, they got like Pakistani accent or something like that. Like, what are you talking about? Like, do you know what you're talking about? Like, when you say Imam Abu Hanifah, al Hanafi, this is the most one of the most important systems of of uh, human creations of 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 legal thought that the world has ever known, right? 
if you if you just uh, uh, if you're non-Muslim, you'd respect the Hanafi school. There was a non there was a non-Muslim Hanafi mufti in Ch Manchester. Imagine that. Imagine you studied Hanafi fiqh inside out and back to front out of reverence and respect for the academia of that system. And you didn't even believe in the Quran and Sunnah. You didn't even believe in the Prophet. Sunnah. Right? So we have to understand how how important this thing is. Right? There's a huge system which is called the Hanafi school. Someone come along and say, I don't respect the Hanafi school. You have a aqidah problem. You don't have to follow the Hanafi school. You can be as un-Hanafi as you want. That's totally fine. But you cannot disrespect it because if you understand what it is, right? Okay, so, well, so he says, etc. We have, uh, etc. So he says, أخبرني أخبرني He doesn't mention who it is. And Salim ibn Abdullah wa Sulaiman ibn Yasar annahuma su'ila an al-ha'idi hal yusibuha zawjuha idha ra'at al-tuhur qabla an taqtasil qala la hatta taqtasil. So Malik informed us. He said, a man I consider trustworthy. I don't know who that is. Said that Salim, the son of Abdullah, the son of Omar. So this is the grandson of Omar al-Khattab. And Suleyman ibn Yasar, again, either he's a freed slave or his father is a freed slave. Were asked whether a husband of a woman in her period may have sexual intercourse with her once she has seen that she is clean. So she her period has finished, but she hasn't had ghusl yet. Is that halal? Uh, but before she does she, she does ghusl, they said no. Not until she does ghusl. قال محمد وبهذا نأخذ لا تباشر الحائض عندنا حتى تحل لها الصلاة وتجب عليها وهو قول أبي حنيفة رحمه الله. He said we had, and Muhammad says we adhere to this. A woman in her period should not be made love to, in our opinion, until the prayer is allowed for her and it's become incumbent upon her. Right? She has made ghusl, etc. Uh, this is the verdict of Imam Abu Hanifa. May Allah show mercy on him. Akhbarna Malikun, Akhbarna Zaid ibn Aslam, and the Rajul and Sa'ala Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here's a huge gap in the chain. So it says Malik, he said that Zaid ibn Aslam. So Zaid ibn Aslam is not a Sahabi. He's of the young Tabi'i. That a man asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ma yashillu li min imra'ati wa hiya ha'id. Qala tashuddu alayha izaruha. Malik informed us that Zaid ibn Aslam informed us that, again, he heard somebody who maybe heard somebody. He's not, wasn't there, was not a witness that the Prophet Sallallahu was asked, what part of my wife is permissible to me while she is still on her period? And he said, she should put, uh, put on her izar, the large cloth wrapped around her uh, lower half. Then your concern is with her upper half. قال محمد هذا قول أبو حنيفة رحمه الله وقد جاء ما هو أرخص من هذا أن عاشتها أنها قالت يجتنب شعار الدم وله ما سوى ذلك. So Imam Muhammad he said this is the verdict of Imam Hanifa may Allah show mercy upon him and this is the position of the majority of the ulama the Shafi'is the Malikis the Hanafis is that uh, between the, that when a woman is on a period you cannot have uh, you cannot uh, 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 have uh, you cannot touch her in a sexual way between her navel and her knee from a belly button down to her knee that's haram and he says something easier than this has come to me has come uh, there's other narrations from Aisha who said she should avoid the place of blood and that's it so basically what is the what is what is haram is touching the filth so as long as you're not touching filth it's fine so he could touch her between anywhere on her private, uh, or anywhere uh, between her belly button and her knees, and um, uh, uh, as long as he's not coming into contact with filth, right? And so this is the position of the Hanbalis, right? This is the position of the Hanbalis, and also position adopted by Imam al Nawi. Imam Nawi adopted this position, and it comes in a hadith in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet said, do anything other than intercourse, anything other than intercourse. Right? So this is not the Shafi school, and it's not the Maliki school, and it's not the Hanafi school. It is only adopted by the Hanbali school. Um, uh, but it's a valid position. Is there anything other than intercourse itself? Right. Um, as long as it's not intercourse, then then uh, it's fine. Right. But the other position, the other madahib say no between the navel and the knee. Right. And in fact, even Ibn Hajar of the Shafis, he said it's what is haram is, and I believe uh, Islamic as well. Uh, is is the navel anything between navel and knee of both husband and wife? 
so that she couldn't even touch him between his navel and knee. The reason being is because touching between the belly button and the knee leads to other things which can lead to intercourse. And whatever leads to haram is haram. Right? Um, but anyway, the positions exist there. Inshallah, we'll stop here. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.